Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Rashi Christie or our online Rashi Christie Symposium. Uh, tonight, we are wrapping up the first week of our program, and uh, we will end this evening with a, a lecture from Dr. Thomas Howe on the influence of uh, postmodernism on biblical interpretation. Now, uh, let me start there and just uh, welcome uh, Dr. Howe. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for taking the time um, and share and to share some of your research over the years with us. My, my uh, honor and my pleasure. Um, I've been at um, Southern Evangelical Seminary since uh, 1993. That was the first year the school uh, started with resident classes um, on a semester pattern. Before that, it were just individual modules. And this has been, the, the whole idea of objective meaning in the text has been a um, subject that has uh, captured me uh, ever since um, I became a Christian, primarily because of the kinds of things that evangelicals have been saying and have said about the possibility of objective meaning. Uh, so that was the um, basic focus of my master's thesis, which was a toward a Thomistic theory of meaning. Uh, then that became the topic of my dissertation, which was the role of presuppositions and pre-understanding in interpretation. Uh, all directed at this question of whether or not it's possible to have objective meaning in the text. The dissertation eventually became the uh, book that um, has been out since 2005. I've also developed a, um, another instance or another edition of that where I've added uh, a lot of material dealing with uh, things like question of faith and reason uh, personal experience and in biblical interpretation uh, and other aspects. Also, uh, the um, nature of God talk um, and this book now, which I have basically made available to anybody, anyone who wants to download it, uh, working on getting the publisher for that. Um, but it's basically the same question because this is the question that is uh, constantly being uh, bandied about and a claim that is constantly being made by evangelicals that there's no such thing as objective meaning. And um, that is um, not only the impact of postmodernism, it certainly is, but even uh, postmodernism is an outgrowth of uh, a critical philosophy that was um, influenced first by Occam in his Lea Moderna and um, Lea Antiqua. The idea in the Lea Moderna, the modern way, was the notion that uh, philosophical thinking, philosophical reasoning should be uh, not uh, governed by any religious institution. And so it should be separate, giving individuals freedom to uh, do their own thinking, regardless of religious commitment. And then, of course, is nominalism, the notion that uh, there are no such things as universals or natures in reality, that universals are only uh, notions in the mind. Consequently, you can't know the world directly. This then became um, a foundation in Descartes. There's no doubt that Descartes, the uh, father of modern philosophy, but, uh, and he bifurcated the uh, mind from the world. And then this, of course, uh, fed into Kant's critical philosophy. Uh, the assumption of nominalism, also the uh, assumption that the uh, world or reality is composed of bodies extended in space, which necessarily means that uh, we can't know the world directly because we can't get bodies into our mind. And so consequently, what is known is only what is in the mind. 
not the world, can't know the world directly. And that's, of course, what Kant asserted. Can't know the thing as it is in itself. And Kant's philosophy has influenced um, individuals throughout uh, modern philosophy into uh, persons like um, Heidegger and Gadamer. And these two individuals, Heidegger and Gadamer, have been extremely influential in evangelical thought. And consequently, evangelicals have um, almost universally rejected the notion of objective meaning. Because, first of all, you can't know the world directly. Second of all, all your understanding of or interpretation of the world or of a text or of anything, all of this is uh, predicated on your perspective, your presupposition, your pre-understanding, this worldview through which you uh, look at the world. Consequently, since everyone's worldview is unique, because everyone's experiences are unique, different training, different upbringing, different languages, different cultures, um, different uh, experiences or whatever, every, anything that makes us up, makes up what we are, that's unique to us. And consequently, since you interpret everything through this, that means that your inter understanding of everything is unique. And your experiences, what goes on in your mind, well, that's inaccessible to anyone else because that's in your mind. Consequently, there is no objective meaning. And this, of course, is for all of the uh, revolt that postmodernists uh, make against uh, class, uh, Chris, the uh, critical philosophy, they actually have imbibed it and it has become a, a basic foundation of their uh, perspective. Um, and so this has been the subject that has um, occupied me throughout um, my whole um, not so illustrious career. Thank so. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Howe. Um, I just uh, quickly want to inform the, our listeners this evening. So uh, uh, Dr. Howe will be speaking on this topic that he's just started, he's uh, introducing us to. But uh, in the description of, of this video, there is also a link to a paper from Dr. Howe, which he will, which is also, um, if you want to go uh, and read up more on this subject, uh, you can go and um, take a look at that paper and work through it. Um, and also, if you want at this very moment, as he's going to talk to us, uh, you can also uh, visit that link. So it is in the description of the video. And um, I guess that's all from my side that I still wanted to mention, Dr. Rao, so you can continue then. Also, I want to let everyone know that um, if you would like to send questions to me in a on a future date uh, you know, want material that I may have available uh, you can certainly contact me uh, on my email which I uh, think will be posted on the in the um, on the site the Rosio Christie site the um, t how at ses dot edu I'd be uh, glad to interact um, it's not just a matter of me desiring to disseminate my lack of knowledge, but also to learn from you um, because I appreciate the interaction because it helps me to think better. So um, please contact me if you uh, so desire. The um, topic um, tonight is basically the influence of postmodernism on uh, evangelical hermeneutics or biblical hermeneutics raises, of course, the question of what is, in fact, postmodernism. And there are probably as many different definitions of postmodernism as there are people who write on the topic. Basically, uh, there is this uh, reaction against what individuals believe to be uh, what they call meta narratives. 
these are uh, efforts to explain reality, life, and everything in one system that is applicable to all individuals and to all circumstances. Uh, this is basically the uh, claim of Lyotard, who, who is usually considered to be the um, most, um, the, one of the earliest and most popularly read individuals on postmodernism, particularly in his um, postmodern condition. He says, to oversimplify, we consider as postmodern the disbelief toward meta narratives. This is uh, the notion that there is no universal explanation about everything or universal system that encompasses everything, reality and experience, that provides a uh, paradigm for understanding and interpreting all of reality. Okay. Of course, the problem with that is, and this is characteristic of postmodernism. I mean, I found this to be you know, the case in every individual who either is a postmodernist or who has uh, subscribed to some of the claims of postmodernism. And that character characteristic is self-defeating assertion. They, they abound in self-defeating assertion. So what Leotard is saying is that uh, we have this rejection of meta narratives which basically turns out to be his own meta narrative. This is the explanation of everything that explains everything, the means by which we then interpret everything. And that is the rejection of meta narratives. Well, that's, that's just a replacement of uh, current or past meta narratives with your own. But this seems to be characteristic of uh, running this all the time. Um, Every one of these authors make these uh, self-defeating assertions. But before we get too far into this, we have to deal with three uh, basic questions. All right. And these are questions that we have to deal with uh, because it sets the um, direction of our investigation. These are the three questions. Is it possible to know? Is it possible to have certainty? And is it possible to have objectivity? Now, the first question, is it possible to know? Of course, this is a question that is most popularly associated with the uh, statements of Descartes. Prior to Descartes, philosophy was primarily initially concerned with understanding the nature of reality. Whereas Descartes asserted, in order to understand reality and how we know reality, first of all, we have to understand how we know, or is it possible to know? But this question is, once again, self-defeating. Reason being is in order for me to investigate whether it's possible for me to know, I would have to know what I am investigating. And in the process of investigating, I would have to know the conclusions or the findings. In other words, if I'm asking, is it possible to know the very quality or characteristic of the mind? that knows is the very thing that you must use in order to investigate whether it's possible to know. So we have to assume that it's possible to know in order to discover whether it's possible to know, but that's self-defeating. So at the beginning, we have to assert it is possible to know. That's just a fact. It's a fact that we cannot uh, meaningfully and consistently do away with. We cannot question that. Joseph Owen said, here cognition itself is the topic for the inquiry, while it is also the examiner. On that account, the charge of circularity arises with the reliability of cognition resting on cognitions 
own reliability. In other words, in order to question the reliability of knowing, I have to count on the reliability of knowing to investigate the question. So we have to admit that it is possible to know. We do know some things. That's just a fact. The question is not, is it possible to know? The question is, well, how is it that knowledge occurs? What is knowledge and how does it occur? Secondly is, is it possible to have certainty? Well, of course, people say, well, no, you can't have certainty. And the question then arises is, are you certain that it's not possible to have certainty? Okay, so the question of whether it's possible to have certainty, once again, assumes the possibility of certainty in order to address the question. Okay, we are either certain that there is no certainty, in which case that's self-defeating. I'm certain of this, that there is no certainty. Or we suspend judgment on whether or not there is certainty. But then the problem is, are we certain that we should spend, suspend judgment on certainty? Once again, it's self-defeating. In fact, the Oxford Companion to Philosophy says, in definition of certainty, a proposition is said to be certain when it is indubitable. A person is certain of a proposition when he or she cannot doubt it. But then, of course, when you go to the same source and, that, and look for the definition of doubt, the definition is when we doubt a proposition, we neither believe nor disbelieve it. Rather, we suspend judgment according to uh, uh, re regarding it as an open question rather than it being true. In other words, the definition of doubt is we're not certain. And the definition of certainty is we don't doubt. Plus, Greg is fairly circular, isn't it? The fact of the matter is, there is certainty. Now, we may not be certain about many things, but there are some things that we are certain about. For example, we're certain of the law of non-contradiction, or what some call the law of contradiction. A thing cannot be both true and false in the same sense. Now, the law, uh, the logical law of non-contradiction is grounded in the metaphysical principle of being. A thing cannot both be and not be in the same sense. Now, we are certain that this is the case because any attempt to deny the law of non-contradiction must count on it. It must assert it. Okay, it must assume it. So, although we may be certain about some a few things, we are certain about some things. So there is certainty. There is knowledge. There is certainty. Both of these have been denied by postmodernists. Okay? There's no such thing as universally true knowledge. There's only individuals and, in fact, what some uh, refer to as knowledge is. All right? And there is certainly no certainty, okay? We can't be certain. So both of these have been rejected by postmodernists, and yet neither one can be meaningfully and consistently denied. Third question, is it possible to have objectivity? Okay, now in response to this, we have to know what does it mean when we say objectivity? So here's a good example. Uh, the state of critical and impartial reflection in which the mind considers things as they are in their own reality under their own real conditions, detaching itself from personal tastes, interests, preferences, etc., as the objectivity of sciences. So uh, the notion of objectivity particularly as this relates to postmodernism, is the notion that we are able to understand the meaning of anything, okay, apart from our own worldview, our own uh, 
upbringing, our own training, our own point of view, we are able to understand the truth, the meaning of anything apart from these perspectives. Now, a postmodernist claims, well, you, you can't do that. And yet, to assert that you can't do that, they are doing it by saying that it is impartially, apart from any worldview or any perspective, it is true that you can't do that. So in order to deny this objectivity, they have to count on it. In fact, every individual who writes or speaks assumes that his words are going to be understood objectively by his readers or hearers. Okay. What's unfortunate is that this notion of a rejection of objectivity is not confined to individuals who have uh, imbibed some form of postmodernism. As a matter of fact, it is rampant in evangelicalism. Uh, individuals like N.T. Wright, familiar with N.T. Wright, denies objectivity. Anthony Thistleton, a major influence in uh, evangelical um, hermeneutics, denies objectivity. Kevin Van Hooser, one of the uh, popular authors in uh, theological uh, interpretation of the Bible, denies objectivity. Grant Osborne, uh, Wheaton, I believe at Wheaton College, um, he wrote the book um, Hermeneutical Spiral. Uh, Grant Osborne, and, and the, the book Hermeneutical Spiral is a very popular book on hermeneutics, okay? And in the first three quarters of the book, he gives you a lot of good information about how to uh, interpret the Bible. But then in the last part of the book where he tries to do philosophy, and here's another characteristic of uh, postmodernism, uh, and I find this to be, I haven't found an individual that uh, actually breaks this uh, trend, these individuals that uh, promote uh, postmodernism are not trained in philosophy, and yet they're trying to do philosophy. Go, you know, well, if uh, I, as a philosopher, were trying to do uh, biology and trying to make statements about biology, the biologists would object that, well, you're not trained in biology. And yet all these individuals who have these advanced degrees in other fields believe that they have the foundation and uh, the uh, capacity to make these uh, assertions, these philosophical assertions, and to talk about these philosophical issues when they are not trained in that area. So uh, Grant Osborne, who is um, a New Testament individual, okay, biblical scholar, begins to talk about philosophy, and he advocates a sociology of knowledge perspective. Sociology of knowledge perspective, which was uh, originally instituted by Karl Mannheim, was the notion that every society and every culture and every different language group uh, influences the way they perceive reality. Okay, and Grant Osborne, evangelical, is advocating that we uh, imbibe this notion that every language group perceives reality differently. Now, you see the problem with this statement? Every language group perceives reality differently. Well, how in the world could you know that? How could you know that a different society perceives reality differently since in your society, you perceive reality a certain way. And since you perceive it in that certain way, you can't perceive reality the way that other society does because that's not your group. That's not your community. Therefore, since you can't perceive it the way they do, how would you know how they perceive it? It's just self-defeating. And then Moises Silva, 
who was at Westminster Theological Seminary said that there's no such thing as objectivity. And the list goes on and on. And we're not talking about individuals who have necessarily imbibed aspects of uh, postmodernism, although there are those, Stanley Grins, Brian McLaren, Crystal Downing, John Frank. All these individuals have uh, largely denied the possibility of objectivity. And yet, in their own writings, they are counting on their readers objectively knowing what it is they are claiming. So objectivity is not only something that is certain, it is unavoidable. It is unavoidable because we all count on our assertions being objectively understood. All right. Now, why is it that these individuals assert this? And when you talk about the, the uh, objectivity of knowledge, it's either knowledge is either objective or it is not. All right. This is another uh, first principle of logic. It's called the uh, principle of excluded middle. It is either A or it is non-A. There's no middle between those two. Okay. If it is B, C, D, or whatever, any of those are not A. So it is either A or non-A. So it is either objective or it is not. It is either A or non-A. If truth, knowledge, is not objective, then it is relative. It is relative to language. It is relative to culture. Okay. It is relative to worldview. In other words, the opposite, the contrary, the contradictory of objectivity is relativism. And we're not talking... Uh, degrees of relativism because postmodernists and many of these evangelicals assert that knowledge is relative to these particular aspects of our thinking. Why is it that these individuals hold this view? Why is it that they object to uh, objectivity? It is because of the influence of critical philosophy, of perspectivalism, particularly uh, the Kantian variety, in which, uh, as Kant said, we cannot know the world as it is in itself. So we think, uh, think of Kant's view as you're existing in this globe. All right. And all that you know is what occurs on the surface, inside surface of this globe as you perceive it. All right. So that's that's all you know is your perception. And what is outside and causing this impression upon your globe, you can't know that's the world. You can't know it. That's why it's called a transcendental argument, because you're transcending your own mind and positing the existence of something out there that is causing this influence upon your globe. So you provide, your mind provides the meaning what he referred to as, and what is characteristically referred to metaphysically as the form, that is the what of anything, your mind provides that by the application, spontaneous application of categories on your perceptions. When you look at a computer screen, you see the shapes, you see the colors, you recognize things, faces, shelves, books, printers, but when you look at the computer screen 
very closely, you discover that the screen is actually composed of little pixels. And these little pixels uh, have different colors. So if you look at the computer screen closely, it's just a group of pixels. Okay, you have to kind of get away from it, push it away so that the pixels begin to coalesce into the shapes that you now recognize. All right, there's a sense in which this is what Kant is saying. The world provides the uh, matter, the disconnected series of sense experiences, which the mind then takes and forms into something that you can recognize, something that you know, something that you can come to know, okay? Something that is uh, meaningful to the mind. What you are knowing then is not the world. It is the product of your mind. It is in your mind. And since your mind has been developed to think a certain way, supposedly, by your culture, by your language. Uh, for example, one individual uses the uh, analogy that, uh, and I, I don't speak French, so some of you may. In fact, I can't even pronounce French. Uh, but this individual says there are two words in French that refer to bodies of flowing water. Whereas in English, there are several words that refer to bodies of flowing water. In English, our words refer to basically the size of the body of flowing water. You know, it's a brook, it's a stream, it's a river. Whereas in French, these two words refer to whether or not a body of flowing water reaches the ocean. And so this individual concludes from this that these different language cultures have divided up reality differently. They perceive reality differently. The French perceive bodies of flowing water in terms of whether or not they reach the ocean whereas the English refer to bodies of flowing water, whether or not they are large or small. Now, the problem with this is, in both French and English, these words are referring to bodies of flowing water. None of these words are used to refer to the Eiffel Tower or to the Rocky Mountains. So, they haven't really divided up reality differently. They're talking about the same kind of reality, bodies of flowing water. So it doesn't indicate that different languages, different language groups divide up reality differently. Okay. It just, that is, that goes back to the uh, principles of linguistic relativity and uh, or linguistic determinism. Both of these approaches have been demonstrated to be false. And linguists have basically abandoned these notions. Linguists, individuals trained in linguistics, have basically abandoned these notions. But who retains them? Well, evangelicals, sociologists. Well, none of them are linguists. And the individuals who are trained in the field have actually abandoned these notions. And yet we find evangelicals continuing to hold on to it. So this idea that language shapes uh, how we perceive reality, well, that's just false. It's been proven to be false. In fact, it characteristics of languages we find, for example, between Russian and uh, Attic, Greek, you find a lot of the similarities in the structure of language, okay, because Russian actually grew out of uh, Attic Greek. So even today, you find the characteristics of Attic Greek in the Russian language. 
you would think that because of this different cultures, well, their languages would be different. They would perceive reality. That's just not what, that's just not the case. That's not what happens. So one of these reasons that these individuals hold on to this rejection of objectivity is because they believe that language shapes how we think. In fact, it's not the case. In fact, there's something going, if you ever had this experience where you're trying to think of a word and you can't think of it and people are saying, you know, is it this? And you say, no, it's not that. Well, you don't have the word yet. You don't know. You can't remember it. But somehow, you know, when this person makes this suggestion, you know, well, that's not the word I'm looking for. You've got a meaning in your mind, okay? But you can't put it into a word because you can't remember the word. So the mind is going through this process of thinking of these different words and comparing them to this meaning that is in your mind and saying, no, 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 until finally go, okay, that's the one, all right? So there must be pre-linguistic thought. When you speak, okay, when you write, you don't sit down, when you're speaking to somebody, you don't go, you know, I need to use a verb here, I need to use a noun there, you know, I need to use this form. It just comes out. So the meaning is already in the mind, and it is the pre-linguistic thought that is then distributed out in linguistic form. If it were the case that language shapes thought, that experience could not be explained. In fact, it could not even be possible, and yet we've all had that experience. So it is just not the case that language shapes thought. It is this notion, these notions of individuals who have different perspectives, different worldviews, all right, different training, different languages, these kinds of things that uh, have led these individuals to deny the possibility of objectivity. Why? Well, because you can't know reality directly. Uh, all you can know is your perception of it. All right. And if all you can know is your perception of it, your perception of it is unique. Therefore, there can't be any objective meaning. Of course, truth is a quality predicated of propositions. And propositions are expressed in language. So if there is no objective meaning, then there is no objective truth. Of course, that's exactly what postmodernists claim. If there is no objective truth, then there's no word from God. There's no meaning about who God is or what he may or may not have done because there's no objective truth. Ultimately then, there's no objective truth. If everything is according to your own perspective, then this claim cannot be true, okay? The claim that there's no objective truth cannot be true because if there's no objective truth, then there's no objective falsehood, then it's all up to the individual's own perceptions, then there's no truth, okay? So if there's no truth or falsehood, except in your own perceptions, then this can't be true, except in your own perceptions. And then to claim, which they do, that this must be the case for everyone, you go, well, now, wait a minute, that's just your perspective. That's just your perception, all right? How do you go from saying that there's no objective truth, it's just your own perception, to claiming that this is true for everybody? Well, that's objective truth, isn't it? So it is this perspectivalism, this uh, 
imbibing of the critical approach, the critical philosophy, the idea that we can't know reality directly. Now this, of course, popularly has been traced back to Descartes, but actually it is traced back to Occam. Nominalism, the notion that there is no, uh, there are no universals out there in the world. There's only in the mind, okay? And what is in the world are only bare particulars, which means that there's no way you can know the bare particulars directly, all right? You can't get those bare particulars in your mind. So what you know is only what's in the mind. And this nominalism then is influenced uh, right into the uh, Renaissance, right into the Reformation, right into modern philosophy. And it is basically the uh, view that is imbibed by modern evangelicals. All right. So this whole question of objectivity must ultimately go back to questions of the nature of reality. Okay. And how it is that we know reality. And this is, these are the questions that these individuals have uh, not really attempted to deal with because they just basically bought into the Kantian worldview. So what is postmodernism? When you take all of these definitions, uh, it's, it's a movement, it's a perspective, uh, it's a point of view, whatever uh, definitions they give, and there are just many of these. Uh, many individuals assert that uh, it is not possible to come up with a definition that uh, can be applied to postmodernism uh, throughout, okay, or, or absolutely. I would contend that there is a definition that can be applied to postmodernism completely. And that is that postmodernism is a hermeneutic. That is, it is a way of interpreting reality. What do we mean by interpreting? We mean being able to understand the meaning, okay, and being able to explain the meaning of anything. Now, it is certainly the case that we are involved in interpretation beyond just reading a text, okay? Uh, we interpret the acts of others. We interpret facial expressions, okay? But there are some things that must be beyond, in a sense, interpretation. For example, the claim that we interpret everything is itself asserted as if that is absolutely true and beyond interpretation. Okay? That that this is the way, uh, this is just another meta narrative, then, isn't it? This is the way it is for everybody and for everything. You, everything is interpreted and it's interpreted through your perspective. All right? Law of non contradiction. Well, that's not interpreted. You can't deny it because to deny it, you have to affirm it. The basic laws of logic, uh, law of causality, every effect has a cause, all right? So there are certain uh, self-evident, undeniable first principles of thought and being that are the same for everyone in every age and in every culture. The, the standard objection to that is, well, you know, they don't think that in uh, uh, these Eastern religions like Buddhism. As a matter of fact, they do. I have a book on Buddhist logic. And in this book on Buddhist logic, they assert the three basic laws of logic, law of non-contradiction, 
they assert that if you say that anything is blue, then it is not non-blue. So it is not the case that there is any culture or group throughout the world or throughout history that can meaningfully and consistently deny the basic laws of logic. They're not subject to interpretation. That's just the way reality is. So there's a sense in which we interpret many things in our, our lives, but not everything is subject to interpretation. Some things are just what they are, okay? So these ideas then that uh, because we interpret everything and we interpret it through our grid is these assumptions that drive postmodernism. It is a hermeneutic and if it is the case that our language and our culture, our upbringing, our presuppositions, all these things determine for us what is and what is not true, then how can we condemn any actions by any other group? How can we then condemn the Nazis? because they were operating on the basis of their own perceptions and their own worldview and their own culture, okay? And yet, this is exactly what postmodernists are doing. They're condemning those who object to postmodernism, okay? Well, that's self-defeating again. This is characteristic. It's just, it's just common among uh, postmodernists. Uh, this idea that there's no object objective truth, consequently, there can be no objective truth about God. There can be no objective truth about postmodernism. And therefore, since there is no objective truth, then Postmodernism can't be true because there isn't such a thing as truth and falsehood. Now, uh, is there a question or two that anyone would like to pose? Uh, Dr. Howe, yes, there's a couple of questions um, that we have. I think I will start with this one since you've already referred to it. Um, it is, uh, what is the, what exactly is the hermeneutical spiral and what is wrong with it? There, now I've come across this as well. Many Christians, and I mean, you've referred to Grant Osborne's book titled the hermeneutical spiral. So maybe just define it and what, what, why is it, um, why would it not be a good theory to, to endorse? Well, it, it really depends on, uh, how someone defines hermeneutical spiral. Uh, in its broadest sense, a hermeneutical spiral is the notion that when you come to a text and you understand the text to some degree, particularly biblical text, it's going to impact you and your way of thinking. And that impact is going to change you and your way of thinking to some degree. And so when you come back then to the text, you come back with this changed perspective. And so the process occurs again. And as you grow in understanding, you, you grow and you change and your perspective change. So there's this spiral, okay, in which you are changed and the text changes you. I think a good uh, explanation of that we find in Proverbs, in the beginning of the book of Proverbs, Proverbs is written in order that uh, it, the Proverbs may instruct the wise and uh, instruct the naive, give wisdom. And it says that uh, you gain wisdom in order to understand the words of the wise and their riddles. Now, why in the world would these wise people talk in riddles. Why in the world don't they just tell us? 
Well, because it is the struggle with the text in order to understand what it's saying that changes you. That's how you gain wisdom. Okay. Now, the problem that we find, say, for example, in uh, Grant Osborne, and this problem has basically been inherited from Heidegger through Gadamer, is the notion that pre-understanding, and that is a term that is used to refer to everything that uh, makes us what we are, the way we see things, our language, our culture, all these sorts of things. Everything about our pre-understanding is changeable, is mutable. And so when we come to the text, we have this uh, set pre-understanding, this pre-conceptual point of view. And as we come to the text, it changes, okay? Now, the problem with this is to claim that every part of your pre-understanding is mutable is itself not mutable, okay? So they are claiming that every that it is an immutable fact that every part of your pre understanding is immutable is mutable. Well, that's contradictory, because there is at least this one immutable aspect of your pre understanding that everything is mutable. And if everything is mutable and everything can change, then there's no truth or falsehood. There's no what's the necessity for changing, for changing what I think. Okay, it's, it's all just my perspective. As a matter of fact, uh, as a part of our pre-understanding, there are aspects of our pre-understanding that are immutable. The law of non-contradiction, law of excluded middle, law of causality, what we call the self-evident, undeniable first principles of thought and being. And it is in fact these that make it possible for us to understand statements in the past, because the same unchangeable uh, principles of thought and being were the same for everybody throughout history, okay? How come? Because they come from the unchangeable nature of God, okay? God instilled this into his creation. So uh, if we take the homonuchal spiral to be this idea that everything in our pre-understanding is unchangeable, uh, that is, everything in our pre-understanding is changeable, there's nothing uh, immutable in our pre-understanding, then it's bad because it's self-defeating, okay? If we understand then that there are self-evident, undeniable first principles of thought and being that are the same for everybody, okay? then the hermeneutical spiral becomes meaningful because I can come to the text and I can understand what uh, the Apostle Paul is saying uh, because he operates on the same basis as I do with these same undeniable first principles. And therefore, I can understand what he's saying. Okay? I hope that helps some. Cool. Thanks, Dr. Howe. Another question. Um, I think it links up with uh, this hermeneutical spiral, but um, many Christians seems to buy into what you've called this perspectivalism because of um, a very particular way of thinking about the concept of a worldview. And it seems to me like many Christians uh, phrase a worldview as if it's this all-encompassing um, framework, but even if, if and, and that everything is a product of of your worldview. That's also, I guess, a problematic way of thinking about yes. this. Yes. If everything is a product of your worldview, then the belief that everything is the product of your worldview is only a product of your worldview. And therefore, it's, it's not universally the case. Besides that, if everything is only a product of your own worldview, how could you know anybody else's worldview is different? Because whenever you look at or talk about or think about somebody else's worldview, you're going to think of it through your own worldview. In which case, is it reasonable to think that 
your pre-understanding, your worldview is going to produce conclusions that are going to contradict your worldview? Well, if everything you perceive is a product of your worldview, then it is unreasonable to think that you could arrive at any conclusions that contradict the very worldview that is producing the conclusion. And yet we know that this happens. Individuals who are atheists, who have an atheistic worldview, read the Bible or hear the gospel and get saved. Okay? Well, the truth of the gospel wasn't part of their worldview. And yet the truth of the gospel penetrated their thinking and changed their life. Why? Because everything that you perceive isn't a part of your own worldview. There are some things that transcend your worldview and are true for everyone, no matter what worldview they have. So this thinking of worldview as if it encompasses everything, well, just can't be the case because the evidence contradicts it. In fact, the assertion itself, it contradicts itself. It's self-defeating. Mm. Thanks, Dr. Rao. There's a lot of questions coming in now. Um, here's a question from a linguist uh, asking what, what's your thoughts on systemic functional linguistics? Uh, my thoughts are uh, completely absent about that because I have no idea. Uh, I would have to read up on that to try to figure out what in the world that is before I could even <laughs> venture the possibility of thinking about it. Uh, so not it's being a linguist, uh, this, this is one of the problems that, that I find also among linguists is this notion that an individual believes he's doing linguistics when actually what he's doing is bad philosophy. I don't know if this is the case in uh, this particular situation, this particular kind of linguistics, but I find that to be, uh, I mean, I, the, I've got so many books on um, uh, linguistics and language and philosophy of language. And I find that to be just a regular occurrence in, in the uh, field. Individuals who having an advanced degree in linguistics, having the training to talk about and think about and write about linguistics, inevitably try to do philosophy. And they think they're doing linguistics. They're not doing linguistics. They're doing but the same thing in uh, um, evolution in evolutionary science. They think they're doing science. They're actually doing bad philosophy. Uh, Dr. Geiser and I were at a symposium in uh, Dallas, Texas uh, many years ago. I think it was just after the flood. And uh, they were, you had the uh, creation scientists and the evolution scientists debating. And we were just standing in the back listening. And Dr. Geiser said, they're not going to get anywhere in this debate because the debate isn't about science. It's about philosophy. And that's true. So Maybe. give me another lifetime to go study this thing about linguistics. <laughs> Maybe I can say something. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, um, Maybe this might help. It's apparently, it, it apparently stems from structuralism. I don't know if that. Oh, yes. Like, yeah. Okay. Uh, structuralism actually grew out of the um, uh, teaching of Ferdinand Saussure, uh, who was who is generally touted to be the father of modern linguistics. And uh, Saussure asserted that uh, there are no pre-existing ideas in the world, by which he meant that you can't know the world directly and you don't get your ideas from the world. So that for him, the linguistic sign is composed of the signifier and the signified. No connection with the world. Okay, signifier and signified. Now, we know the meaning of any particular signifier, that is a word in our language, 
in our linguistic structure, our, our lexical structure. We know the meaning because it differs from every other meaning. So we know it by virtue of this difference. And so we know the meaning of a particular word because how it fits into the structure of the language. Okay. So now this was taken uh, by, um, what's his name? I uh, can't remember. Uh, Levi Strauss. This was taken up by Levi Strauss in his investigations uh, of different cultures. And he, uh, he, uh, asserted that the meaning of various uh, aspects of the life in this particular uh, culture were understood in the structure of this culture. This was then extrapolated to everything. Everything is understood within a particular structure. Okay, so it only has meaning within that structure. Now, the problem with that is they're claiming that apart from every structure, everything only has meaning within a structure. Well, either that assertion only has meaning within their structure, or it is universally true of all structures, which is exactly what they're claiming, in which case it's self-defeating. So structuralism was actually, uh, when it began to become popular in the US, uh, a lecture was given by Derrida, uh, and after his lecture, structuralism died. So, uh, but there is a residue. Uh, it's, this is the way thought seems to develop historically. You have a particular view that makes an assertion or claims. The view as a whole is uh, uh, rejected, but there's a residue. That, that is retained and that continues to influence uh, culture and influence thought. It's like a, a snowball, you know, rolling down a hill. You start out with a little snowball in your hand, but by the time it gets to the bottom of the hill, it's collected all this other snow and now it's a big ball, okay? So you had this residue of structuralism, this idea that things are understood only within a structure that now are still uh, parts of different perspectives. Postmodernism is same idea. Perspectivism, it's meaning within a structure. So if this linguistic uh, perspective has grown out of structuralism, it suffers the same shortcomings as structuralism. And structuralism has basically been uh, um, abandoned uh, at least as a philosophical perspective. But here again, what you have is individuals in a field, because they have an advanced degree in that field, believe that then they then have the foundation to be able to talk about these philosophical issues. You go, no, you, you don't even understand the, the nature of structuralism, the history of structuralism, okay? And this idea of understanding everything uh, within a particular structure was not new with structuralism. You can go back to the uh, Theotetus of Plato and uh, Pythagoras' views are basically this idea of the uh, man is the measure of all things, that everything is seen through your own perspective and your own structure. So this, this is a ongoing uh, perspective that you find throughout history, not a major perspective, but nevertheless a present one. Okay, cool. Thanks, Dr. Howe. There's a Question um, asking about the what is known as the analogy of faith or scripture interpret scripture. Maybe you can just unpack that because there seems to be a lot of misunderstanding surrounding yeah. that uh, principle. Yeah, uh, this idea of scripture interpreting scripture, of course, has a long history as well. Uh, the problem with this is that if I'm trying to understand the scripture, and I want to go to another scripture to help me understand this scripture, then what scriptures should I go to out of the whole Bible in order to use to help me understand this one? Well, that process of selection, which ones should I go to, that process of selection already assumes a theory in the mind. 
you are deciding because of your uh, point of view or your perspective, you are deciding which passages to appeal to. So already you have introduced your interpretive grid in the very selection of which scriptures to go to. Okay. You look up, oh, we're going to use a concordance. We'll look up words. Well, the problem with that is words don't always mean the same thing in every context. Okay. So just because they use the same word doesn't mean they use this word in the same way. Uh, Frank, you heard of Frank Turek. Yes. He did a he did a talk at SES and he, he made the assertion the uh, Gospel of John was written by John. The Gospel of John was written by 96 AD. Now the question is, well, who wrote it? Did John write it or did 96 AD write it? We we'll go, no, it's two different uses of the word by. Okay. Well, there you go. You got the word by, same word, okay, meaning two different things, okay, one's source, one's temporal, all right? So just because you look up words doesn't mean that these other passages are talking about the same thing. So uh, you can't just re you can't just say, oh, a scripture interprets scripture. Well, I have to have evidence and support that this scripture actually is related to that scripture. What was the other part of that question? No, I of think the analogy of faith. Yes. 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 The, 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 it's, it's the same with the analogy of faith. Um, we have to be careful if we take the term analogy of faith to refer to the fact that we have a doctrine that we support from the text and we want to support it by appeal to other passages of scripture, then we have the same issue here. So scripture interpreting scripture and uh, analogy of faith is not necessarily a bad thing, but the way that it is used is a bad thing, okay? Because we have to be much more careful. We have to marshal the evidence, we have to show that these things are related, okay? And when it comes to um, scripture, interpret scripture, the first thing I want to do in any scripture is interpret it in its own context, okay? I can't pull it out of his context in order to make it apply somewhere else. I have to understand it first in its own context. Um, you probably, or you may have heard people talk about uh, slaying the giants in your life, you know, referring to uh, David and Goliath. Well, the woman, I have to ask, is that why the book was written? Was it written and that e event was included in order to teach you how to slay the giants in your life? Well, uh, the problem with that is, uh, well, when David slew the giant, he was in Israel. Did we have to go to Israel to do it? Okay. Uh, David was a young boy. Do I have to be a young boy? Why do we pick out certain events or certain parts of a, a narrative and make that apply and then just ignore the other parts? So we have to understand what kind of literature is it? Is it narrative? Why, how does it fit in the book? What's the story about? Who are the characters? Okay. There are certain literary features in the text that help us to understand these things. When we understand a passage in its own context, then we can take that passage and see how it relates to another passage. But we have to do that with that other passage. But that's particularly when it gets to uh, uh, books on eschatology, you know, you, you find that oftentimes an individual will make an assertion and then you'll say, you know, and look at all these other verses as if somehow that magically makes your interpretation correct. Okay. And the same with the analogy of faith. We have to be careful to build our theologies, our doctrines, based on our understanding of the text in its own context. And then what is, and when we come to the text, you know, you, you talked earlier about this idea of uh, people getting together and say, what does it mean to you? 
okay? Our first question when we come to the text of scripture should not be, what does it mean to me? It should be, what does this text teach me about God? Because that's what the scripture is supposed to be. God's revelation to us. So this scripture, this is given to us in order to teach us something about God. So I should ask, what does this teach me about God? What do I know about God from this? And then what do I understand in this particular narrative? What do I understand the relationship between God and these individuals in these events? Once I understand that relation in that context, then I can extrapolate from that how this applies to me. I can't go from that narrative directly to me. I have to go in that narrative to God and then to me. So we have to be careful in the use of these principles. And uh, I used to be uh, reluctant but now that I'm old, in fact, I am already as old as my parents were when they were my age. <laughs> so, I used to be reluctant to say these things in my youth um, as a young Christian. I think uh, I became a young Christian uh, shortly after Joshua crossed the Jordan into, so it was a long time ago. Uh, one of the things we have to do is we have to become familiar with the original language uh, of the text. And it's not just a matter of looking up words. It's a matter of understanding the language. Uh, what is being said, how it's being said, the you know, uh, if I may indulge for a moment, uh, Gospel of John. Uh, in the beginning, God, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? That's, that's the English equivalent to what the Greek text means. Kai thaos ein halagos. And so the Greek actually says, and God was the Word. So the word theos actually comes before the verb, ain, was. And ha lagos, the word, comes after the verb. All right? But what Greek did was, uh, because the nouns have different cases, and in this case, both the word theos and lagos would be in the nominative case, so they have the same ending. All right. So you couldn't distinguish which one's the subject and which one's the predicate nominative based on the form. What they would do is they would put the definite article with the word that was the subject. So you know this is the subject, that's the predicate nominative. Once you have that mechanism, then you can move words around in the text. Okay. Because how they are functioning in the sentence is going to be determined by their morphology or the grammar. The association of definite article with the word indicates subject. So then we have to ask, well, since halagos is the subject, why did he put it after the verb? Why didn't he put the os after the verb? Because that's the way we would say it, and the word was God. It would actually be uh, wrong to say God was the word, because God is not only the word, he's the spirit and the father. So what is John doing by doing that? Well, he's emphasizing. He's not saying in the beginning was the word and word was with God and the word was God. What he's saying is in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So he's emphasizing that. This is important. And that's why he puts it up front. Understanding syntax, understanding grammar, these things are important in understanding the text. And these are the kinds of things that we have to deal with if we're going to employ principles like comparing Scripture with Scripture. 
analogy of faith. We have to be able to deal with these issues. And if we don't do it ourselves, learn the language, learn the grammar, learn the syntax, then we have to rely on others who have. And I think of it like, this is probably crude, but hey, it's what I do. Uh, I think of it kind of like somebody chewing up my food so that I can swallow it. Yuck. You know, I want to be able to chew the food up myself. <laughs> so we have to be able to deal with these issues in order effectively. Like I say, uh, scripture, scripture and analogy of faith are not uh, necessarily bad things. But the way they are popularly used is just bad. Go ahead. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Al. It seems like it also becomes a rhetorical device. People just think that when they employ the words, I interpret scripture with scripture, that makes my position correct. Oh, absolutely. That's a very good observation because that's exactly what happens. So um, here's another question. Um, how does the abandonment of objectivity affect the church and her ministry practically? Uh, whether there is a uh, widespread impact on the church would require more kind of investigation than has been done. The potential, however, of this influence, and I find this to be uh, the case in um, talking to individuals who come to seminary, individuals who, well, particularly individuals who have grown up in a local church, in the youth group, and uh, then they go off to, to uh, college, and everything that they uh, were taught, they begin to abandon because of the teaching in the university. So the, the potential here is the notion that uh, there is no objective uh, meaning in the text. Therefore, there is no objective truth. Therefore, I don't have to believe the things that I was taught in uh, Sunday school. Uh, I don't have to uh, believe this particular interpretation. I can believe whatever I want. I can take what I want out of the text and make it uh, what I want it to be. Uh, we find in um, individuals who are Christians who have imbibed postmodernism doing this very thing. So you have out there in print on a popular level, individuals who are making these very kinds of claims, okay, that uh, we ought to um, enjoy the fact that there are these differing views and, and conflicting views, because after all, it's all uh, personal and subjective. So, for example, um, Crystal Downing, I don't know if anybody can see, but Crystal Downing's book is called How Postmodernism Serves My Faith. Okay. Well, now, this is published by uh, a university press. And basically what she asserts you know, University Press publishes a lot of things uh, and a lot of things on popular level. And, and she asserts that very thing, the idea that uh, we should uh, be open to these contrary views. OK, except, of course, we should not be open to the contrary view that we should be open to the contrary views. OK, so it's basically self-defeating. But this idea of relativism, as it uh, permeates the uh, Christian press, uh, permeates, it, it goes into the minds of those individuals who are trained in seminaries to become pastors in churches. And then, you know, I, I was, uh, I went to visit a church in which the pastor basically said that there's uh, no such thing as objective truth. He's preaching that from the pulpit. So uh, the kind of influence is the undermining of classical Christian theology, 
classical Christian belief, and then making all belief uh, equally uh, significant, and you can basically believe whatever it is you want. And and that's the way that we see the uh, print print media in uh, Christian publishing. That's the way they're going. And these individuals who are these uh, prominent and influential individuals, uh, Kostenberger, I mean, it's just about name any of them. And that's what they're touting is this idea. There's no objective truth. There's no objective meaning. Therefore, there's no objective truth, which ultimately means you can believe whatever you want. I think it's, it's a, a, a crisis uh, you may be familiar with Alan Bloom, who wrote the uh, book, The Closing of the American Mind. Right at the beginning, he says, there's one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering the university believes or says he believes that truth is relative. If this belief is put to the test, the one can count on the student's reaction they will be uncomprehending. So here you have a group of young people in a local church and it's conservative and, and teaching uh, classical Christian theology and then they go off to university and they're confronted by individuals, peers, who argue that truth is relative and professors who do the same. These are individuals in authority, these professors saying the truth is relative. And so Christians, young Christians go off to university, their faith is wrecked. You familiar with Bart Ehrman? Yes. Okay. It is his mission. He actually asserted this. It is his mission to destroy the faith of every Christian that comes into any of his classes. So it's just, it's, it's frightening to me. Mm. Thanks, Dr. Rao. Here's a, here's a question. Um, don't the Roman Catholics have a way around this whole issue with regards to the magisterium? Isn't it a better route since other forms of Christianity um, don't have a guiding principle that author authorizes interpretation? Well, this is my own personal position, uh, I would rather not have a group of individuals authorizing my understanding of scripture. You know, I want to do that myself. I want to get in there and, and study it and understand it myself. Um, but the magisterium hasn't always presented a consistent view throughout history. So uh, a lot of people think the magisterium is a is com uh, composed of these um, professors, theologians, that sort of thing. It actually isn't. It's composed of the bishops, the individuals who are in are working in churches. These are the individuals who compose the magisterium. And the magisterium doesn't meet on a regular basis. You know, it's not like they have magisterium meetings every week. Okay, it is a group that is called together to meet to make some determination about some issue or topic. Okay, so, uh, and, and of course, also to do that, to, to make some sort of authoritative statement about what it is, how you're supposed to understand this particular scripture. So, um, to have some sort of group, uh, what gives them the capacity to make these determinations over and above any other individuals in the organs in the church? Okay. Uh, are their assertions then not subject to investigation? Well, gee, I want to know. Uh, we, do you say this is how to interpret this? But I want to investigate that myself and discover, you know, is that really what's going on? Is it or isn't it? I want to look at it myself. I want to study it myself. I want to understand it myself. And the thing is, is it not only involves... Uh, getting into the text and reading the text, studying the text, studying the language of the text, okay? 
It's also investigating one's own perspective, one's own worldview, one's own presuppositions, one's own pre-understanding, understanding philosophical issues, because these philosophical issues influence these judgments of these individuals, these bishops in the magisterium. What philosophy do they have? What are they alchemists? Are they nominalists? That's going to severely impact their conclusion about uh, what any particular passage may mean. So all of these things are important in an individual making a judgment about the text. Okay, and uh, it is not inherently a better system to have some group dictating this is how you should understand the text. That kind of is analogous to a dictatorship. This is how you should live. This is what you should think. Okay. No, I, I want to get that from the text myself. Thanks, Dr. Howe. We have a, um, a question here. Um, I really enjoyed your lecture. It was great, but I don't think the link between Kant and relativism really works. I see Kant's project as circumscribing the limits of human objective knowledge as such. Just because human knowledge is limited, it does not mean it is not objective. Everybody sees the pixels. Kant does not allow for linguistic imposition or cultural relativism. I think one cannot jump from Kant to say uh, Rorty or Supperwolf. I have no idea how to pronounce that last name. Well, the problem here is that uh... Kant declared that we cannot know the world as it is in itself. That's a basic, in fact, he said his Copernican revolution was instead of believing that the mind conforms to the world, we should rather think that the world conforms to the mind. So since I can't know the world as it is in itself, all I can know is my perception of the world. Now Kant claimed that this was the case for humans, but there's no way in his own system that he could possibly know that. And in fact, Feuerbach, uh, Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, uh, these individuals actually uh, actually attacked uh, Kant on that very point. You cannot know that this is true for every other individual since you cannot know these individuals as they are in themselves. And since it is the case that what you know is the product of your own mind, the application of spontaneous application of the categories in the act of spontaneity upon the intuition, okay? Since that is the case, then what you think is the product of your mind, it's relative to your mind. That's exactly what relativism is. It's the claim that your perception, okay, is unique to you. Of course, Kant claimed that it was the same for everybody, but there's no way he could know that. Okay, Hegel actually uh, attacked that as well. Uh, but it is this notion of perspectivalism. It's the way you perceive it. That is the foundation we might say, of relativism that goes all the way back to Plato and Pythagoras. It's how you perceive it. You can't know how it is in itself. It's not a jump to go from Kant to relativism. Relativism is instilled in the very principles of Kantian critical philosophy. Cool. Thanks, Dr. Howe. Um... Here's a question. Uh, I'm just, let me see here. Dr. Howe, I was told there was an Italian writer named 
Emilio Betty, who supposedly held views similar to yours, do you know of any of his works? Or do you know if any of his works were dealt with in English? Uh, I am familiar with the name, but I have never read his material. Okay. So that's uh, yet another thing that I have to put on the to-do list, <laughs> among all the other things. <laughs> the very, the very last, or so they say, the very last Renaissance man was Voltaire, and uh, that's because after Voltaire, knowledge began to multiply. Uh, to the point that it becomes virtually impossible to be a Renaissance man anymore. Uh, if you, in a single discipline, could read a thousand pages a day, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at the end of 70 years of reading in your single discipline, you would be over two million pages behind. That's, that's how much is being produced out there. And when you take into consideration uh, self-publishing, I, I can imagine the uh, numbers are even greater. So. Well, yeah, that's encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> um, like the, the saying, you're familiar with the saying uh, that, um, Jack of all trades, you familiar with that saying? Yes, yes. And the, the actual saying is Jack of all trades, master of one. <laughs> okay. It's just a master of being a jack of all trades, basically. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what does Dr. Howe make of the idea that the apostles use pro prosopological exegesis of the Old Testament? Uh, that claim is not is not uh, verifiable. Uh, it is not the case that the apostles uh, took from the Old Testament and uh, made the text say whatever they needed it to say to fit in their own uh, situation. That's that's just not even good. Even though it is true that the vast majority of uh, quotes that are that occur in the New Testament were taken from the Greek Old Testament. That's comparable to what we do, because when we quote from the Bible, we quote usually from the English Bible. You know, we don't usually quote from the Hebrew Bible or from the Greek Bible, and uh, that's basically what they were doing, because the Greek uh, Bible. The Greek Old Testament uh, was the Bible or the text that most people would uh, be familiar with. Uh, the, if I may per be permitted another indulgence, what we think of as the uh, Septuagint is not one big monolithic thing, okay? Uh, in about... Um, 200 BC, uh, some elders did go to Alexandria and probably translated into Greek the Pentateuch. But then over the course of centuries, portions of the Old Testament were translated into Greek. There were some individuals who translated the entire Old Testament into Greek. So the Greek Old Testament that we have today is a compilation of the um, bringing together of all these different translations, okay, into a critical apparatus. So uh, what exactly was the Greek text that Paul was using? Of course, Paul no doubt could read the Hebrew as well, being a Pharisee. John could probably also read the Hebrew Bible. Uh, but Hebrew was was not the lingua franca of the people during the time of the apostles. It was Aramaic. It was and they they brought that back from uh, Babylonian captivity. It's very close. It's very possible that Hebrew grew out of Aramaic, but that's not for certain. 
So um, none of these instances, and they're just, I've got tons of books on this too. None of these instances where the um, apostles are quoting from the Old Testament, have they manipulated the Old Testament to make it say uh, something that it didn't say in its own context? And if, if you have examples that challenge that, send them. I'll deal with them. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Dr. Al. Um, we have about uh, three or four questions left. So I don't know what's your time. Oh, I'm fine. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so here's one. If, objectiv if objectivity is possible, then why are there so many Christians that differ on what the Bible says? Because there are so many things that impact our interpretation of Scripture. To say that objectivity is possible is not to say that it is inevitable. Okay? So uh, I may just be interpreting things incorrectly, uh, interpreting a passage incorrectly. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I don't know the language well. Okay? Uh, I don't understand the uh, culture in which the uh, text was written. I don't understand the nature of the literature. I don't understand the literary devices that are being used in the text in order to help me grasp what the text is saying. I'm being influenced by personal bias. I'm being influenced by um, my environment. I'm being influenced by other factors. So there's just a multitude of factors that will impact our interpretation. So objectivity is possible, but that doesn't mean it's inevitable. It doesn't mean we always get it. Hmm. And so when you go, you go historically, you look at um, Orthodox Christianity, the, the doctrinal beliefs of Orthodox Christianity have been uh, pretty consistent throughout history. In fact, there has been more variety in conflict in natural science than there has been in the interpretation of scripture in the orthodox tradition of orthodox we mean the classical doctrines of uh, god and christ and uh, the holy spirit thanks dr Allen. then um uh, i'm gonna take the next two questions and try to formulate it as one because it's aimed at on the one hand, it's aimed at the role of the genre of, of a passage. And on the other hand, it's the same principle, but just like the question would be, does genre determine the meaning of the passage? And on the other, other hand, does the, um, does the intention of the author determine the meaning of the passage? When it comes to genre, now, how do we discover the genre of a passage? Well, we have to read the passage. If we don't already know what a genre is, okay, we have to read and study the passage in order to discover what the genre is. So there must be some possibility of me understanding the meaning of the text without knowing its genre in order to study the text in order to discover its genre. So genre does impact, but it doesn't determine meaning, okay? On the initial level, the meaning is determined by other factors, okay? Use of language, okay? The, the principles of uh, logic and reason. So uh, there's a, an initial level in which I can enter into the text and understand it in order to discover its genre. And then now that I understand its genre, I have a better grasp of the meaning. Okay, but the genre enha enhances my ability to understand the meaning, but the meaning comes from the text. Okay, uh, and the genre helps me to, do, to understand that. When it comes to the intention of the author, uh, how do you know what an author's intent is? Well, in a way, you can know what his intent is just by what he says. You can't get into his mind. Okay, uh, and Therefore, the only way I, the only access I have to his intent is in his text. 
So, and then you hear uh, individuals like um, individuals like Grant Osborne talk about the fact that, well, you know, because Paul isn't here, we can't ask him. But let's assume that Paul is here, and I ask him, well, what did you intend when you wrote this passage? Well, what is he going to do? Well, he's going to give me another text. Uh, he's going to explain. Well, now I've got to understand his intent of that text. Well, what did you intend by the text you gave me to explain the intent? of the text you first wrote. Well, then he's gonna to have to give me another text and on and on, and that's an infinite regress. So the only access I have to an author's intent is his text, his words in his text. Therefore, it is not my task to try to uncover some intent in the mind of an author. My task is to understand what does this text mean? because that's all I've got. Cool. Um, Dr. Rao, what is the, uh, no, wait, what's this? Let me just, it's not on the paper, it's here on the screen. Uh, are the logic not themselves presuppositions? Yes. There are laws of logic that, well, if we understand presuppositions as a particular point of view, then yes, the law of non-contradiction is not a point of view. It is a presupposition. In fact, it is an assumption on which we operate, whether we're aware of it or not. Everybody operates on it. When you come to a, a traffic uh, intersection, okay, and you're at the traffic intersection and a big truck is coming down the street at 60 miles an hour, you're not going to pull out in front of it. Why? Because it's a law of non contradiction. <laughs> if you pull out in front of it, that truck's going to contradict you. <laughs> perhaps uh, fatally, okay? Yes. So we operate on these things. In fact, uh, I remember when I was in uh, um, uh, Dallas, uh, Texas, and uh, I was a, pa a sign painter working in a sign shop, and we were kind of sitting around talking, and this uh, individual said, well, you know, there's no such thing as truth. I said, wow, is that true? <laughs> And he said, well, you know what I mean? I said, no, I don't know what you mean. What do you mean? And of course, you know, he couldn't explain it because he's counting on the law of non-contradiction. He, he can't get around it. Another individual said to me, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm a Buddhist and we believe that uh, all avenues to God are equally valid. Whereas Christians believe that only through Jesus can you have access to God? I said, well, you're saying the same thing we are. Oh, how's that? I said, well, you say that the only access to God is the way you say it is. That is that all avenues. And that mine, the only my avenue is the right way is a contradiction to that. So you're saying that your way is the only way. I'm saying my way is the only way. Law of non-contradiction. He went, wow, I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> I know I know. in your book on objectivity, you label the, um, the laws of logic as trans, transcend, uh, transcendent presuppositions or something yes. like that. Transcendental presuppositions. Transcendental presuppositions. Yes, that's because uh, the... I use that expression, and that's not a universally used expression. That's just something that I used in order to try to capture the notion. Uh, I call them transcendental because they transcend every worldview. They transcend every perspective. They are the same for all perspectives of all people in all languages in all of history. Okay, They are undeniable. In any effort to deny them, you have to affirm them, okay? They are self-evident. Now, uh, Aquinas talks about the fact that there are uh, two senses in which something is self-evident. It is self-evident in itself and to us, or it is self-evident in itself and not to us. So, for example, that no part... It, uh, uh, the whole is greater than any one of its parts. Well, that's self-evident. 
But it's not self-evident to a child who doesn't know what whole part and self-evident means. Okay. So it's self-evident in itself, but it may not be self-evident to us. So Aquinas argues that the existence of God must be self-evident in itself because God's being is his essence. But since we cannot can comprehend God's evident, uh, essence, it is not self-evident to us. We have to discover that. We have to learn that by investigation, by revelation. So uh, first principles are self-evident in themselves, whether or not they are self-evident to us. And we realize that they are self-evident when we become familiar with the terms and the proposition. So, uh, in fact, I've kind of lost track of where we were going with that. What was Oh, transcendental pre uh, yeah. presuppositions. The idea is that these first principles are transcendent. They are the same for everybody. They can't be denied, okay? Because the effort to deny them affirms them, all right? And all of these principles are ultimately grounded in being, okay? Cool. Um, here's a here's a question. Uh, is is Simon Brace the most handsome student you have ever taught? <laughs> uh, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> I guess not in not uh, yeah. exactly the same sense. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, he is a tremendous force, isn't he? Uh, the Rosho Christie would not even be in existence without. Uh, he basically created all this uh, while at SES. Uh, a tremendous person. And you would have to ask his wife about whether or not he's the most handsome. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, there's a question. Uh... Uh, could you say something about Aquinas' position that all knowledge begins in the senses and is completed in the intellect? Yes. Uh, all knowledge begins in sense experience because that's how we come to know. And we, we ar arrive at knowledge. It, everything that we think, okay, ultimately has its relation to, not directly, but ultimately has its relation to uh, sense experience because that's how we learn. That's how we know. We know through our senses. But yet what we receive through the senses, we also then can reason about. And we can take sense experiences, okay, and we can compare them and contrast them. And consequently, we can grow in understanding, okay? So all knowledge begins in experiences, but it is perfected in the intellect. Aquinas says that um, it is not the senses that know, it is not the intellect that knows. It is the person that knows by means of his senses and his intellect. So it is a whole package. Uh, it's not just the intellect that knows, not just the senses that knows, it's the person that knows by these means. So yeah, it's perfected, in, and there are many different ways to uh, acquire truth, okay? Uh, this is another error of the um, postmodernists, and that's the rejection of uh, all foundationalism. The, the uh, arguments that they make against foundationalism are basically the deductivist foundationalism of Descartes, but they don't touch Aquinas' foundationalism. Aquinas' foundationalism is a reductive foundationalism, which means that we can take any proposition and reduce it to first principles. And if it contradicts first principles, it can't be true. Okay? But that truth may not derive from first principles. I might get that truth in many different ways. God could reveal it to me. He has in his word. Okay? Okay? I may take the uh, statement by a trusted friend as truth, okay? And 
Now I can take that truth and I can investigate, well, is it really true? Okay. So there are many different ways that we can get truth. Uh, some things actually do derive from first principles, but not every, every truth. So all these uh, objections to foundationalism, all of these individuals, do, none of these guys that I have read have any, any concept of the reductive foundationalism of, of Aquinas. And so all of their anti-foundationalist rhetoric has to do with Cartesian deductivist, that you start with, uh, I think, therefore I am, and you deduce truth. Well, that's geometry. You know, you start with these axioms and then you deduce the geometrical principles mm -hmm. from that. Uh, knowledge just doesn't work that way. In fact, when Descartes starts out with, I think, therefore I am, he's already violated his own principle. Who is this I that thinks? Okay, that's not self-evident. That's not undoubtable. The undoubtable first statement should be thinking, therefore thinking is. Not I think. He's already covertly imported into his first principle an I that he's not accounted for. Okay. And uh, Jacques Maritain points that out in his uh, book, Degrees of Knowledge. Very good book. All right, um, Dr. Howe, I was wondering if you can maybe maybe just end by, um, uh, maybe you can point us to some resources that you think would be good. And then also if you can maybe just, if you have a word of encouragement for some of the students, you can also take some time for that. Um, I would recommend, uh, depending on the level of training an individual already has, in terms of philosophy, uh, Wilhelmsen's book, uh, Man's Knowledge of Reality, because that is a, a very good introduction to, uh, to mystic epistemology. Uh, and I use that term epistemology reluctantly because prior to Descartes, there was no discipline called epistemology. Uh, he basically developed that. So what we're talking about there is cognition. So. Wilhelm's book on uh, man's knowledge of reality is a very good introduction to, to, uh, to mystic uh, cognition. Uh, when it comes to the question of uh, objective meaning in the text and objectivity, um, I don't have any recommendations. I have yet I have yet to find an author who uh, subscribes to the notion of objective meaning in the text. So, I mean, I can send, I can be glad to send you the stuff that I have for what it's worth. You may read it and discard it, say this is trash, or, or you may read it and use whatever you want from it. So, but uh, I have yet, to, well, I take that back. There is one individual uh, who does subscribe to the notion of objectivity of meaning, and that is Walter Kaiser. Um, in his, um, not his book that he did with Moises Silva, uh, Introduction to Biblical Interpretation, not that one, but his other stuff, he does uh, subscribe to that. Uh, when you get past going back, you get beyond uh, the 1960s. Uh, generally, what you find is individuals who are talking about interpretation are not attempting to do any philosophical speculation. They're just talking about principles on how to interpret the text. Uh, what happens in 1960 is the English translation of Gadamer's Truth and Method, Wahrheit uh, und uh, Methoda. Then uh, the English translation of uh, Bultmann's article is presuppositionless exegesis possible. Uh, those two uh, things 
extremely influenced hermeneutical thinking. And we can see this in the uh, book written by Bernard Ram, Protestant Biblical Interpretation. In the 1950s, he did a small book, Protestant Biblical Interpretation, in which uh, he laid out basic principles for interpreting scripture. He didn't do any uh, presuppositions or philosophy or anything like that. He came out with a new edition in the 60s in which he basically changed his view and begins to try to deal with these philosophical issues. And he does it very badly. So we see this transition happening. So when you get beyond the 60s, of course, you, you find individuals who are uh, promoting various aberrant views. But when it comes to biblical interpretation, most of the time what you find are individuals who are writing books on just how to interpret scripture. It's after the 60s that you get into these individuals, and they are forced to do that. These individuals are forced to deal with these philosophical issues because of, that's the uh, academic climate. Uh, University Press published a book uh, called Linguistics and Biblical Interpretation by two guys, Cottrell and Turner. And in their book, they say you cannot know the meaning of a book of the Bible. All you can know is your hypothesis about the discourse meaning. God, that is so self-defeating. How do they know that my understanding of the meaning is only hypothetical? How do they know that any understanding is hypothetical unless they have the non-hypothetical measure by which to measure interpretations of everyone else. InterVarsity Press, very popular book. So you can really see the influence of this uh, philosophy, this philosophical perspective. Uh, I have uh, bibliographies that I have put together on various uh, topics. Uh, and if you're interested in these bibliographies, now, they're not annotated, so I don't say, oh, this is good, this is bad, that sort of thing. Just, you know, and the bibliographies that I have are only the books that I have in my own personal library. But if you're interested in any of those, I'd be glad to send them to you. Thanks, Dr. Rao. You can, you can send it. Um, uh, we, can, we can, I'll make it available. But I can okay. just, since uh, Dr. Howe didn't recommend his own book, I can also just recommend <laughs> that. <laughs> But um, Dr. Rao, if you have any last words of encouragement, I think the students would appreciate that. Yes. Uh, the, the encouragement is to get into the text yourself, to study not only the text, but to understand these philosophical issues and how they impact, you know, and just keep digging, keep studying keep thinking. And uh, as uh, Solomon said in the Proverbs, you know, uh, iron sharpens iron. Talk, discuss, think about, you know, uh, poll, uh, investigate, talk to other people, see their views, and uh, just keep pushing it, keep pushing it. Uh, it's, it's just a lot of work that still needs to be done and there's a lot that every one of us can do so the greatest thing is the fact that we all know Jesus ultimately we're all going to be in heaven where everything will be revealed I don't know if that's encouraging but you know what they say in the old country? Sure is an old country. <laughs> Thank you very Oh, wait, here's, here's one last question from oh, Simon. Sure. Is, is Richard Howe the most handsome of the Howe brothers? <laughs> he's certainly a lot more handsome than I. <laughs> <laughs> and he's Look, a lot um, smarter. He's a lot smarter than I am, too. That's uh, a fact. <laughs> 
Look, Dr. Howe, it's been a real blessing uh, to talk to you and to, um, uh, to have this time with you. So thank you very much. It's been a blast. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for you. having me. I, I really appreciate it. It's been an honor and, a, and it's been great. It's been fun. Yes. <laughs> All right. To the listeners out there, thank you very much. We will kick off on Monday evening, evening again with the rest of the symposium. Take care.